I'd like to speak with you today about sacrifice, uh, what it meant uh, to our early uh, fathers, what sacrifice meant as in the ultimate sacrifice in Christ, and what it does and means for us today. And with that, I'd like to start out in Matthew 5 and verse 10. And it reads, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my name's sake. Verse 12, Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. In the Roman times, the people came. They didn't start out that way, but as Rome grew, they became to worship the emperor. And, and it would ended up being, it was required that it, once a year, each Roman would have to come and say that Caesar, he is my Lord. And that caused a lot of Christians problem because they could not say that they, and one particular Marty, martyr was Polycarp he was an aged bishop of Smyrna uh, and after he was captured he was given a choice either sacrifice to the godhead of Caesar or die and he said I've been 86 years with my Lord and he has done me no wrong and they put him to death and we'll go on with Matthew 13 5 13 I'm sorry verse 13 you are the salt of the earth but if the salt has lost its savor wherefore shall it be salted it is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden underfoot of men. And in the ancient times, salt was one of the most pure things. It was made from water, and it was made from the sun. It was pure white, and it shone of purity. It was also used in the, the meat sacrifices of our people in the early days to help preserve the meat. And so... <clears throat> So saying a person was the salt of the earth was to also say that he was a pure person. Verse 15. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Thank not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. 18. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot and one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all is fulfilled. 19. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall, be exceed, shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. The scribes and the Pharisees at the time, they made their own, they came from, from their law from the Torah, but that wasn't enough for them. They wanted to go into specifics of the law. They had to make their own specific. If they're not to do a burden on a day, well, how big of a burden? And can this person do it? Can that person do it? The traditions of men. 
is what it boiled down to, and it was carried down from them through the ages by word of mouth. Around 300 A.D., they came up with a book they made of all of these that they had written down, and it's the Mishna, and in English, it was 800 pages long. And these were the traditions of men that the Pharisees had to bring themselves away from everybody else so that they could abide by all these traditions of men calling it the law. And he's saying, don't, don't go there with it. He, he didn't come to change the original law, the original Ten Commandments. He did come, though, to change the ordinances and stuff of that, na that nature, which we will get into later. But the law is a law as it has been put down, and we allow men to monkey with it and make it say what he wants to, to his delight, and then expect everyone else to follow suit. And I guess the Ten Commandments can be brought down to as little as two words, reverence and respect. It's respect of God, respect the name, reverence of God's day, respect of parents, life, property, personality, truth, a person's good name, and yourself. The reverence and respect do not <clears throat> consist of obeying a multitude of petty rules and regulations. They consisted not of sacrifice, but in mercy, not in legalism, but in love, not in prohibitions, but instruction for a positive commandment of love. Matthew 23. Uh, 22, I guess. Today you can go to 21. Yeah, let's do 21. I guess I didn't do that. Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill be in the danger of judgment. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council, but whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and thou rememberest that thy brother hast against, ought against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. So through his gift, sacrifice, God's saying don't just come and sacrifice. That's not good enough. Don't sacrifice and come bring your sacrifice to me. If you have at odds with somebody, go settle it with them. Take care of what the problem was. Let's get this under control and taken care of. Then you can come back and ask for my forgiveness from the Father. And with that, I'd like to go to Mark chapter 9. And we'll start at verse 43. Mark 9, 43. And if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maim than having two hands to go into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched. 
where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter, halt into life, than having two feet and be cast into hell, and to the fire that never shall be quenched. Where their worms dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. For if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be gassed into hellfire. Where their worm doth not, <clears throat> and the fire is not quenched. And this saying is not to be taken literally, but it's a vivid Eastern way of saying that there is a goal in life worth sacrifice to attain. I'd like to go to John 2. with verse 12, John 2 and verse 12. After this he went down to Capernaum, he and his mother and his brethren and his disciples, and they continued there not many days. And the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem and found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and changers of money sitting. And when he made a scourge of small cords, he drove them out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overthrew their tables and said unto them that sold doves, Take these things hence, make not my father's house a house of merchandise. And he was angry for several reasons here. Uh, And the prophets told us in Isaiah uh, in Jeremiah 7.22, Hosea 5.6, Hosea 8.13, God was no longer pleased with burnt offerings. Jesus acted as he did to show that no sacrifice of any man animal can ever put a man right with God. In Mark 11.17, my house shall be called the house of prayer for all nations. And in the temple, there was the first court. It was the court of the Gentiles. The second court was the court of women. Then came the court of the Israelites. And then there was the holy of the holies. And the Gentiles' place of worship was where all this money changing and the animals were stored and everything else was going on. The Gentile was not allowed to enter past the court of the Gentiles. I'm sure he was offended by the fact that with all the oxen, the sheep, and the doves making noises, the money changers, and the hoopla that would have been going on in bargaining, it would be hard for a Gentile to come into his temple and worship and have a place to study and to worship God. And also, uh, one of my last, uh, most one of my recent lectures, I went into very specifics of that the money changers, the, the specific money had to be a cer certain type to be paid to the temple for the temple tax. And the long and the short of it is, is they ended up paying to them in their time a day's wage to get change made out of other currency. Uh, and to them that was a lot at the time. Uh, also that the animals that were sold in the Gentiles court they whatever animal was given for sacrifice had to be inspected and had to be approved by the priest the priests were the ones selling the ones in the Gentiles courts if you buy a cheaper one outside it's probably not going to cut the mustard to get you in so several several reasons for him to be very angry uh, at the time of the temple. Okay, and we'll go to Romans 3.
and we'll go with 19, Romans 3 and verse 19. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, but every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. 21. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifest, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. 22. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a preposition through faith in His blood to declare His righteousness for the remission of sin that are passed through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say, at this time His righteousness, that He might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. In Jesus Christ, by His life of obedience and His death of love, made the one sacrifice to God, which really and truly atones for the sins on the cross. And the cross opened the door for the right relationship to God. And that's with a sin offering. The thing that was done with that is to make the relationship between yourself and God back to normal. If you sin, it's made a separation. And if you sinned against a person, that made a separation there. He wanted all of those to be taken care of through the sin offering, and then it would be taken care of. And we'll go to 1 Corinthians 10 and 14. Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak as to wise men, judge ye what I say. The cup of blessings which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we bring many... For we being many are one bread and one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread. 18. Behold, Israel, after the flesh, are not they which eat of the sacrifices partakers of the altar? What say I then that the idol is anything? For that which is offered in sacrifice to idols is anything. And with, at the time with the Greeks, which Paul was around at the time, and it, it, his mission was to convert as many of the Greeks as he could, they knew of and had, at the time, all the people believed, even the Greeks that were not Christian, believe that any food that were brought to their temple for sacrifice or that they were to eat, if there were demons or souls on board, it needed to be sacrificed to their God in their temple. And they didn't burn. The, the object was for them to eat theirs, so they would maybe clip a few hairs off the head and burn those, maybe a certain portion. And it depends on how they were brought into it. 
But the result being the rest was meat. Some just cut the head off, use the head. The rest was meat to be had. But they would bless it to their idols, to their gods. And what we're going to be coming up against here is we're seeing the Christians and the Gentiles, or the Gentile, I should say, Gentiles were converted to Christians, but their past history, past performance, the way they were raised, they're trying to unlearn from doing those things. And they would take the meat and eat the meat, whatever was left over from this particular unit may very well end up in a market, and we're going to see that here in a minute. And it's what can we take the communion with Christ? Can we deal with Christ? And can we, can we or should we partake of this meat? It's been dedicated to an idol, and you may not know whether it is or not. And we'll go, I think I got to verse 20, I think. But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that ye should have fellowship with devils. In other words, if you, if you do their thing, you're fellowshipping with their devils. 21. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of the devils. You cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of devils. 22. Do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than He? Are, are we stronger than Christ? There's no way you know anybody's stronger than Christ, so just uh, don't do it. Uh, 23. All things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. 24. Let no man seek his own, but every man another's wealth. 25. Whatsoever is sold in the shambles or the stores that eat, asking no question for conscience sake. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. In other words, everything's God's. If you don't believe in the devils and the, the idol is nothing to you, Maybe it's nothing to me. It, it's, all, it's all from God. Everything's from God. 27. If any of them that believe not bid you to a feast, that ye be disposed to go, therefore is set before you, eat, asking no questions of conscience' sake. He's out trying to save these people or turn them into Christians. If he's invited to their social event and you don't go, how are you going to convert them if you don't go to them to help to try to convert? So don't ask any questions. Don't don't worry. You know, just like everything everything is made by God. So do that will. Twenty eight. But if any man say to you, this offering in sacrifice unto idols, eat not for his sake that showed it. And for conscience' sake, for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. If someone stops you, just a newly acquired, newly learned Christian, if it would offend him that you do, don't do it. If somebody is on the other hand of the Gentiles and said, okay, you by being a Christian eating of what I told you is an idol makes you not a Christian. Well, don't eat it. Okay. Twenty-seven, I think, is where I got to. If any of them have <clears throat> that believe not bid you to the feast... Now, I did read that. Okay, twenty-eight, sorry. But if any man say unto you, This is offered in sacrifice unto idols, eat not for his sake that showed it, and for conscience sake of the earth. I did I read that as well. Okay, I'm gonna move on. Uh, 
Okay, 29, conscience. I say, not thine own, but of the other. For why is my liberty judged of another man's conscience? For if I by, by grace be a partaker, why am I evil spoken of for that which I give thanks? Whether for... Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatever ye do, do all in the glory of God. Give none offense, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. Even as I please all men in all things, not sinking mine own profit, but the profit of many that may be saved. And from there, we're going to go to Ephesians 2 and 13. Uh, Ephesians 2, 13. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who hath made both one and broken down the middle wall of the petition between us. He's broken down the walls. The walls, even an example, maybe the temple even, between the the uh, court of the Gentile and the court of the Israelite. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, hear that well, in ordinances, for to make himself the twain, one new man, so making peace. And the Christians and the Gentile, the, the the Jews and the Gentiles were had a fence put between them because of their past learning and traditions, if you would. And Christ is the one that can bring down those walls, take the two, blend them into one, and make both to get along and have basically one man. 16. And that he might reconcile both into God in one body, by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. 17. And came and preached peace to you which were afar off and to them that were nigh. He come taught to those that were near. He taught to those that were afar off. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. And through his sacrifice, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, he brings all men to the presence of God. Ephesians 5. One, yeah, 5, 1. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. And this sweet-smelling savor was used almost 50 times in the Old Testament saying that it was a good sacrifice, a worthy sacrifice to God. Verse 3, But fornication and all uncleanliness or covenant, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jest, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this ye know that no whoremonger or unclean person or covetous man who is an idolater, 
hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God unto the children of disobedience. Be ye not therefore partakers of them, for ye are sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. And in walking in darkness are equated to not seeing the, the Greeks. At the time, they had a pretty, um, I don't know really what, loose, I guess, would be probably my best way of saying society. It, they had no problem. It was fine with them. Uh, uh, they were to the point of having in their temples, uh, they had prophetesses that they called, which were whores. They had no problem in taking the money and using the money to build temples. Their, their morals were very, very low. They, it was no problem for them to go to the, the temple whores, if you would. It was no problem to step out of marriage and do just whatever they wanted to. And he's saying, but come out of the darkness, see the light, and be a child of light. Uh, we'll go to Philippians 4, 14. Notwithstanding, uh, did I, okay, 4.14. Notwithstanding, ye have well done that ye did communicate with my affliction. Now ye Philippine, Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Mesopotamia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. In other words, as he left, the only people, the Philippians were the only ones that supported him, took care of him, and they had a mutual understanding. Paul planted seeds there, got Christianity started there, and they supported him throughout his travels. 16. And even in Thessalonians, Ye sin once and again unto my necessity, because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. But I have all and abound. I am full, having received of Ephedotriathus the things which were sent from you, an odor of sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable well-pleasing to God. And there were, uh, back in Corinthians, there was a dispute about the Corinthians not taking care, repaying Paul, or whatever, or not repaying Paul. Paul didn't ask for anything. Paul was very much on his own. He was grateful for what they did for him because he knew that it was for God. And we'll go to Colossians 1. And 24. Yeah, and I'm going to back up just, I'm going to go back up one sentence. I, Paul, made a minister, and then 24, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up 
that which is behind of the affliction of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. Wherefore I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God, even the mystery which had been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God hath made known that is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope and the glory. And through Christ, is what he's saying, you can take the riches of this mystery to the Gentiles to convert them to Christianity, and it won't be a mystery to them anymore. 28, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that may we may present every man perfect in Jesus Christ, whereunto I also labor, striving accordingly to his working, which work in me mightily. And with that, we'll go to First Timothy. One and twelve. <clears throat> and I thank Jesus Christ our Lord, who hath enabled me for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. 14. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all exception that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of who I am chief. 16. Howbeit for this cause I obtain mercy that in, my, in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all longsuffering for a pattern to them which should hitherfore believe on him to life everlasting. Now unto the King eternal, immortal, invisible, and only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. And as Paul is saying here, he's pretty well self-explanatory. He's felt of himself that he was the chief of sinners. Uh, it says first, but the worst would be more appropriate in going against Christians, uh, cutting them down, persecuting, terrorizing them, and we all know the story of the conversion. But through all this and the grace of Christ, God turned him around, or God turned him around so that he could help out the church. And with that, we'll go to Genesis 22. Genesis 22, verse 1. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, 
whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. 3. And Abraham rose up early in the morning, and saddled his ass, and took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son, and clave the wood for the burnt offering, and rose up and went into the place of which God had told him. And not only did he not question God about doing this, he got up early, he went to do it, he gathered a supply of wood. His intent was to go ahead and fulfill what God had asked him to do. Verse 4, Then on the third day Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw a place afar off. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again unto you. And with the third day, we can somewhat take this as a type of Christ, if you would want to think of it that way. And again, he's showing that he is intent of going ahead and fulfilling God's commandment to him and that he's leaving the two servants behind so that they wouldn't stop him from doing what God had asked him to do. Verse 6, And Abraham took the wood and the burnt offerings and laid it upon Isaac his son, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went both, on them, both of them together. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, Father, and he said, Here I am, my son, and he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Eight. And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. Nine. And they came to the place where God had told them of, and Abraham built an altar there, and laid the wood in order, and bound Isaac his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. Full knowing well what he was doing, he was following the commandment of God, showing his intent to do exactly as he was told. 10. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. 13. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold him a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. And Abraham called the name of the place Jehovah-Riah, as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. And the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven a second time and said, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this, this thing and hast not withheld my son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee and multiply. I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. 18. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou obeyed my voice. No matter what he was going to do, he was going to go ahead and do through loyalty to God, what God had asked him to do. And don't take this today and say, well, God told me to go kill the guy. So I did. It's, that's, well, I think we're a little bit beyond that with this story. He's showing to, we have no power over God and what God's going to do. If he asks us to do something, who are we to question what it is that he wants us to do? If he, if he normally will provide a means or at least a help. You know, we've got to do the work, but he'll provide means in a way to do what he asks. 
but have faith no matter what. And I want to go back to Hebrews 13. start out with verse 9. Be not carried about with divers of strange doctrines, for it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats, which have not profited them and have been occupied thereon. We have an altar, wherefore they have no right to eat, which serve the tabernacle. And it, the, the, the strange doctrines he's speaking of are the traditions of men, the ceremonial, the ceremonial law was abolished with Christ. And what he's saying here is if you believe that Christ came in the flesh to the earth, was sacrificed and rose again to give us glory, you may receive, embrace, and possess the blessing possessed by it. If you adhere to ceremonial law and traditions of men, you have no right to eat of this altar. 11. For the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burnt without the camp. 12. Wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. Let us go therefore unto him without the camp, bearing his approach. For there have we no continuing city, but we seek one to come, which is heaven. 15. By him therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually, that is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to His name. And at this point, after Christ, the, the sacrifice is praises and offerings are to simulate the offerings of the first fruit, 16. But to do good and to mute, communicate, forget not for with su such sacrifice, God is well pleased. And we go to First Peter two and four. Verse 4. To whom coming is <clears throat> unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. And it was disallowed. It was rejected by the men in the majority, the scribes and the Pharisees of the most. Ye also, as lively stones, are built up on a spiritual house, and holy priesthood. Originally in the old days the priesthood was set apart. The, the priests were set apart. They were set aside. They were uh, appointed. Uh, there, that was their specific office. With the coming of Christ through prayers and praises and all good works done in faith, all are priests under Christ to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God and Jesus. 6. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Sion a chief cornerstone, elect preciousness, 
and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you therefore which believe he is precious, but unto him which be disobedient, the stone that the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. And the stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. And the scribes tried to take the stumbling block. They tried to build their own traditions of men type church, not under God, but under traditions of men, and they grossly failed with it. Verse 9, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, an holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, that are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Before the conversion, there is mercy in God's heart towards His people, and so there is in the covenant of grace and which was shown in the provisions of His Son as a Savior and the mission of Him, the redemption by Him. This is not available to them until they accept Christ. And then they obtain mercy, having in their regeneration an evident display of the mercy of God towards them and an application of His pardoning grace and mercy through the blood of His Son, Jesus Christ. Um, Yahweh, dear Heavenly Father, thank You for this platform. Thank You for the ability of this chapel to get the Word out and around the world today. In the name of Yahshua, Jesus Christ. Amen.